Hi everybody and welcome to Under the Hat this week with Gavin and myself. Uh, we're delighted to have our Colson Ledbetter CEO, Ben Richards, with us. Ben, how are you doing today? Good, thanks Stuart. Gav, nice to see everyone. Perfect, thanks for joining us, Ben. Um, so today's topic is all about the journey of golf zone led better and, and Ben with you b building a global brand which we are truly global um, at the moment but before we get into that and looking at where we are presently and where we may go in the future as a business um, it'd be great to hear a little bit about your journey up to the point of joining the led better um, academy brand and um, see you know what you can impart knowledge-wise for, for all of us to help us with your journey and your inspirations along the way. Sure. Well, I, I, don't, I can't claim I built this brand, but I certainly um, inherited an amazing global brand that I feel responsible for its future and safeguarding it. Um, so I'm sure we'll get into the, the, the history of the Ledbetter brand and what's coming up in the future. Um, but I, I came from outside the golf industry um, so we started in back in Norwich in an, uh, an advertising agency, really with kind of a background in marketing and communications, and then worked for Norwich City Football Club um, for a couple of years in the marketing department. So that kind of that was a uh, that was a passion as much as a as a job, I think. Um, but that kind of got me to understand the world of professional sports and how marketing and the brands interact, and obviously you're dealing with with very high and low emotions when you're dealing with football clubs and you could work, you could work your tail off all week coming up with the best strategies, the best marketing. And then the team loses three nil at the weekend and it means nothing. And equally you could sit on your hands, the team wins seven nil and um, everyone buys tickets the next day and merchandise. So it's a really sports, a very emotional, volatile business. So it, I, I love the, I've always been passionate about sport, played a lot of sport growing up. Um, had a, a desire from fairly early on to be in marketing and understood that brands and developing brands were was a, a real interest of mine and then fortunate enough that through my career I've always had a, an international role that's that's dealt with global brands and global business um, so after after Norwich City I moved down to, to London and worked for a, a sports marketing agency and we did global sponsorship um, contracts and negotiation. I specialize more on, on the marketing communication sides of, of these big deals. So we would sign, um, you know, global sponsorship contracts with the Olympic Games or World Cup or Formula One or golf or whatever it might be for our clients. And then I would help those brands to get a return on their investment and actually use those properties effectively and um, really very broad base of different sports. So I was allowed to I guess learn what worked in certain sports, maybe didn't work in others, but equally there was a lot of things that was transferable across across these different disciplines. Um, and that's ultimately what got me over to the States. So the agency I was working for in London was acquired by a, a bigger agency in the US um, just before the London Olympics in 2012. So I was brought over to the US because I think I had the right accent more than anything else. <laughs> and um, was consulting on the Olympic Games back in London from the US, um, and so kind of went through went through the couple of Olympic cycles, working with rights holders and a huge variety of different athletes. Was fortunate enough to work with some incredible, both Olympians and Paralympians, um, understanding their stories and what it takes to be a champion and that single-minded focus and. Um, yeah, inc incredible characters I met, so certainly on the Paralympic side of things. That was a real kind of learning curve about overcoming odds. And there were some very obvious ones, some very sort of physical ones, but then the mental ones and others that are maybe less obvious to see. These guys had, guys and girls had incredible grit and uh, you kind of woke up every morning trying to emulate their passion and their energy that they had to life to, to be on a podium or whatever it, whatever it stood for. And in, in, you know, in your personal life. Um, so after Olympics, a couple of years later, I was still working in, in New York for the same agency and had, um, had had a relationship with David for probably, I think I first met David in 2005, actually in Orlando at an event for SAP, who was a, one of my main clients at the time. And SAP did a sponsorship contract with David that lasted 
up until last year actually that was a really really strong partnership that that lasts a long time um and so through that relationship over the years i'd always kept in contact with david and was fortunate enough to play a round of golf with him actually in hawaii at an event and that's kind of what sealed the deal and so he asked if i'd be interested in coming across and working for him and that was back in 2005 um so that got me that, that gets us up to current day i guess no, brilliant. No, great story. Great to hear a little bit about your background. Some things I didn't even know in there um, as well. But I think you knew just, I was a Norwich fan, Stu. Surely uh, I knew you were a Norwich fan, but I didn't know you'd actually worked for Norwich. But the fan, the fanships come out of necessity, not through yeah. choice. Eh? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you're talking about you know the the world of disability. It just reminded me a little bit of recently. I've kind of started teaching um, a student of mine that says. Uh, just over 30 years old and he, he had a stroke a couple of years ago uh, he's lost all views to the right side of his body plays golf left arm only now and it exactly what you said you know you, you think sometimes you're having a tough day and then you, you he's called Stuart as well you spend a morning and an hour or so with Stuart and you think he's got such a determination, a grit, a passion, such a happy demeanor. It, it puts things into real perspective sometimes, just just spending an hour in his company um, and then obviously mm-hmm. working out and being adaptable to how we need to develop some speed and swing the club, et cetera. But yeah, there's definitely a lot to be learned from, from that world as well. So um, I think we all understand from a a golfing point of view and a business point of view, we've we've all faced some real challenges, especially over the last year with everything that's gone on in the world and is going on in the world. From a business point of view, what challenges have you seen, Ben, in terms of pre-COVID and during COVID um, from your side of things in leading, um, you know, a global brand? Yeah, I mean... Clearly, there's been a lot of change in the last 12 months. And uh, however prepared you are for change, you can never really preempt everything. And I think we were just being very honest. We were all caught by surprise about how severe the changes were going to be. Um, so we had a we had a business plan that was all planned out in January. And by February, end of February, March, we'd torn it up and we had to start again. And so... Um, I think it was a massive learning curve about trying to keep people together and not to cause too much concern and alarm when perhaps privately there were moments where you were sitting up at night saying, oh my God, how are we going to get through this? But you can't allow that to um, to kind of filter through maybe to the team and the company. And so, um, yeah, there was it was a real a biggest, definitely the biggest business challenge I've had is would have been last March, April, May, trying to understand how you, how you, how you protect the the core values of a business through a completely unknown environment, a completely unknown business environment where all the rules were suddenly reversed and torn and torn up and uh, a coaching business that relies pretty much solely on personal interaction. um, And with a, a small sort of online digital business that we'd only launched six, seven months before. Um, we were we just weren't prepared for what we needed to be probably for for the online business and the digital world that then took over. And we sat on a Zoom call doing this. This wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for COVID probably. And yeah. so I think we as a business we had to understand what was what was the most important thing um, for us to protect as a company. And then how would we make sure we were in a position to rebound as quickly as possible once this was all over? And again, we didn't know the timeline of that. And uh, Frank Rabot, who's our, one of our board members, who's the chairman of the Evian Championship at the Danone Group, um, has been a really close advisor to me. He's a, again, he's a board member on our company. So I get to talk to him about you know, using his experience. And he said, just figure out what, what the most important thing is to the brand and then look after that and clearly in the discussions that we were having it was our people mm-hmm. and a, a brand like ours that relies so heavily on its people we had to protect and look after them as much as we could so that when the doors reopened we had the top talent and the top the top people to 
to rebuild and re and rebound as quickly as we could. And so that was we had a we had a hierarchy of decisions that were being made during that period last year when we were having to restructure and change things. And it was always people first, um, and then the customers and the brand and everything else had to come after that. And it worked. I think it worked out. And you know, th things succeeded last year, which we didn't think would succeed and things failed, which we thought would succeed. And you just learn, I think business is ever evolving. Um, and I think if you, if you kind of fight and resist change, then you're going to get left behind. And there's so many businesses that you can, you can read about that that's the case. Um, so, so it was very, it was a very interesting period i think we've come out of it far stronger um i think we're far more aware of our strengths and weaknesses as a business i think mm -hmm. we've um we've, we're in a much better position now because of covid ironically than we would have been if it, if it hadn't happened which is would have been i wouldn't have said that this time last year when we mm -hmm. were kind of in the darkness um so yes it's been a interesting journey i think our our biggest if, if there's a a missed opportunity is clearly that we weren't quite at the point where we wanted to be with um, the university platform and what we could do digitally. I think we did some really good things. I think the summit was was a great success. There was some yeah. some some great learnings and some things that we pushed where we needed to be able to communicate to our clients um, remotely and through online platforms. So um, I think the lessons we learned in the last 12 months have now been put into practice, which is which is really encouraging for the future of the business, I think. Yeah, no, I would agree with that, Ben. And, you know, certainly from my side with the, the university and the education and obviously together with Gavin, um, you know, the fact of COVID that spurred us on to do the virtual summit and start these virtual calls. Um, and it's something we had talked about and it was one of those things that was on the radar but sometimes you're never spurred into taking the action and, and you know, just making it happen. And, and that was on the back of the virtual summit, Gavin and I said, listen, we wanna make sure that every week we do something for the instructors around the world. And if they can't make it, they can't make it, but let's at least record it. And mm -hmm. let's make sure that we do stuff little and often to make sure that there's a real concerted effort to try and look after the development. And I think, again, it, it really goes back to what Frank told you is something that David always says to us and is on the wall at Champions Gate there, that those who dare to teach must never cease to learn. And Gavin's responsibility, my responsibility under you is to make sure that we offer that environment and opportunity for all of the instructors around the world but also give them the platform and, and everybody that's on this call today or watching is make sure that they have the opportunity to present as well and unfortunately i missed paul dyer's presentation i know paul's on as well but him and ian did a great presentation and we've been fortunate to have some amazing speakers and some real golden nuggets of information and and at the end of the year you think we'll have 52 sessions that will be real quality speakers and great information and, and stuff that's evergreen where people can go back and watch it. So I think it's really given us the platform to springboard from. The new Mighty Networks platform should hopefully be a great point for us to help develop that community as well. Uh, but moving on to you know, what we see for the future, it'd be great to hear a little bit from you as for all of the coaching team around the world, all of our associates, what you see as the real opportunities here, hopefully post COVID in the near future. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I'll just touch on what you're saying. We do have that slogan, those who dare to teach must never see learn written on our wall. And that's probably, the, that's the easiest thing is just to get a paintbrush out and put it on a wall, but it's really difficult actually then to, um, to implement and to the only way you implement it is by living and breathing it every day. Yeah. And so, the actions of doing these kind of under the hat series and creating content and being collaborative and open, I think is really important. That's, I think that's our responsibility to the brand and to all of the, the network of instructors and academies and students that we have within the group. And that's, that's what is going to carry on from that mindset we had during lockdown that if we can enable our people to perform to their best, then our brand is in, really safe hands and so mm -hmm. the two biggest areas that we're focusing on is development of people and that's um that's clearly what 
the whole purpose of this and the, you know the, the the message we're trying to get across is that we will provide every resource that we can to help people develop as individuals and as coaches because the byproduct of great coaches are great lessons and i've always maintained that david's major victories aren't the the, the thing that we should be shouting about that's what david did as a business and a brand the development of coaches is our biggest success by a mile and the careers that we've given to hundreds and thousands of golf coaches all over the world i think is is our legacy and what we stand by and that's the future of the business and i've got no doubt there will be coaches that we develop that go on and have really successful careers like david but um we would have played a part because we've given them an opportunity and enabled them to do that and so a lot of the things we're doing like the new um, mighty networks platform is an enabler for people to communicate and to to feel the strength of shared learning and to enable them and try and make it as easy as possible for people to connect and to learn that's really our goal as a as a as a company and then things like the brand and developing new ideas and new products and services that all layers on top if we don't get the first bit right if we can't mm -hmm figure out how to build a the strongest network of led better people and by that that doesn't mean they have to be a fully certified 10-year 15-year veteran of the business to be a led better person that's somebody who has received some kind of help from us and has interacted and engaged with us that might be as simple as turning up and listening to a free webinar that we've given, but that's given them something. So I would still class them as part of that network. And yeah. I think our goal is to try and cast that net as wide as we possibly can. So that the, the disciples, if you like, the Led Better disciples, the people who have, have believed in ongoing learning and education and golf will carry the brand on into the, into the future. No, sounds great. I think obviously we, we spend a lot of time with the instructors with the certification process talking a lot about the technique and um, faults and fixes cause and effect communication with clients, the physical side of it, the technology, the mental. Um, but obviously often a missing part for the golf instructors is really understanding how to grow their business. What would be some advice for you, for the instructors that are listening that um, that you would say would be kind of some key areas for them to really help grow their business moving forward or establish some good good protocols or best practices really i think that the processes and the practices are the bits that enable you to get a brand and to build up your own business but i think everybody us included have to figure out why we do what we do because the only the only way in a business like ours which is a Typically, it's quite an emotional purchase. Right? There's rational purchases. I need milk. I need, I need petrol for the car. I'm going to go fill up. And you just go find the closest place to go and get that. The other end is the emotional purchases. I want to buy a new car because I like that brand or I want to get better at golf. Those are quite emotional purchases. There's a, there's a rational reason behind buying a golf lesson in that people realize that a teacher can give them expertise but it's really a very emotional decision to say i want to get better it's an ego other than the top one percent in the world who are playing for money everybody else is doing this for passion enjoyment um, and to get more out of themselves and so i think we're in a really fortunate position because there's an incredibly strong bond that can be made between a teacher and a student and so I would really challenge all of our coaches and all of our academies to go through a process of not working out what you sell. So there's, there's three areas clearly to building any brand, what you do, how you do it, and then why you do it. And um, it should be individual to you. We've gone through the exercise as a business a couple of times now where I've challenged the corporate team and the staff to, to, to answer those questions of, what, what, what we do clearly is the service that we offer. So in our case, that's uh, golf lessons at Champions Gate and then licensing the brand and the business and licensing and educating people online. Um, to our coaches, it's delivering a golf lesson. And so what you deliver is not who you are and is not the reason that somebody's going to come and buy a golf lesson. Um, millions of golf coaches around the world offer golf lessons. Um, so you need a differentiator. You need something that 
is authentic and gets you out of bed every, every morning to go and do what you do and you deliver the passion. So if you start on the outside of the sort of circle, that's what you do. How you do it is clearly the knowledge and the skills that you have as a coach, right, which you've honed over years and years. So how you deliver your, your business and your brand um, is quite a tactile thing. It's the, it's the knowledge. The more knowledge clearly you have, the better it is and you can, you can give a better lesson. So that's kind of the first outer two layers. And then the heart and the core of this is why you do it. And why you do it is probably the hardest question maybe to ask yourself, but it's the strongest position you'll have and it will give you the longest ability to deliver a great service. And everyone will have a different reason why they became a golf coach. And it's always um, an altruistic reason. Very rarely why you do this is not, to make money money and the money you make is a result that's not a reason to do something and so if you're successful if you have a good reason why that you want to be a teacher you want to help people you want to develop the game whatever your reason why is that that stays as your bedrock and that never changes and then how you do it can evolve and develop so you might say how i'm going to do this online now so coach like lawrence that left india and is now doing all his coaching online pretty much until sort of Leeds gets open. He had to change his how, and he's done that very successfully. Um, and then the, um, the reality is that you then can deliver something that's pretty, pretty authentic. So that might be a bit sort of high, high perspective of things, but I think you get that right. Then a lot of everything else will fall into place and it becomes quite tactical then of how much you charge your lesson and, where am I promoting it? Am I on social media? Am I not? Am I, you know, am I creating promotions to try and push certain lessons? That's complete tactics and that can vary whenever you want it to, but I would definitely challenge everyone to write down their reason why they do what they do. And that becomes the bedrock of, of the brand and the business that, that they create. That's great advice. I think it's something that I try and challenge all of the, the new trainees that come in uh, through certification to go, you know, from a coaching point of view, you know, why do you coach? What's your mission? What are your values? And start to get them to think. And it's amazing that a lot of coaches, even if they've been teaching for, for 10 or 15 years, they, they, some of them struggle to go, actually, I've not mm. really thought about that. Uh, but I think, I mean, like you said, it, it's a key point. And I know, Gavin, with Ledbetter Kids there, you part of the, the certification is that you have the whole champion business module that focuses specifically on a sustainable junior business. You know, from your side of things, you speak a lot with um, the guys and girls that you work with about how to develop a sustainable junior business. Would there be anything that you would add to that? Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, I, I'm keen to understand from you, Ben, how much time you think a coach should dedicate to the development of their business, uh, almost like on a, on a weekly basis. Because I think that, uh, especially as we go back to coaching in the UK, um, there's this massive influx of students and everybody's just too busy to do anything, right? Because all they're doing is coaching, which I think is really dangerous. Um, I think the caveat with that as well is the fact that I don't think coaches truly appreciate their own value. So they're, they're leaving a lot of money on the table. But in terms of the development of their business and taking their business forward into the future, how much time do you think that they should attribute to that on a, on a weekly basis, do you think? Um, well, clearly it's important, right? Because if you don't get the business part right, you don't have a, a job anymore. And so um, I think it's actually not so much maybe about the time that they put in, but about understanding um, what their end goal is for, for their business. And typically, if you really start digging into it and asking people what they want, a lot of people want a sustainable long-term future. And so it's not about short-term gains. I mean, it's, it's very nice to pick up a, you know, 20, 30 new students because lockdown's just ended and you've got a ton of lessons. But if they don't come back and repeat business, then you don't have, um, you don't have anything, right? You're always chasing the next, the next student. And I think the, 
the bit that has to be understood is that unless you have a proper mechanism and a proper business structure in place that can get um, can get clients to come back and to refer your business to other people, um, then you're always going to be chasing chasing the next lesson. And so, I think there's a there are so many uh, there are so many different um, structures that you can put in place for golf coaching. There isn't really one answer to say this is your this is how you set up a coaching business. It's going to be independent and it's going to be relevant to the local market and the coach's experience. But there is one golden rule within our business and that's the number of repeat customers you have and the number of referrals you get in and that's the biggest determining factor of the success of a golf coach and a coaching business because you can't you can't keep having a high turnover of students and 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 be a successful sustainable golf coach you need uh, you need the repeat business you need referrals and especially in in uh, in our world where um golf there are there are a lot of different levels of golf coaching and there's some really good coaches and there's some really poor coaches and there are some great brands in coaching and there are some poor ones so there's a real there's a real variance it's very hard for probably the consumer to actually understand if they're getting a good golf lesson or not or getting good value or not so um there isn't a industry standard that says this is a five-star coach this is a four-star coach it's very it's very discretional. And so what you tend to find is that the coaches that do the best job, who are the best coaches, the best um, at the, what they do, their best art of teaching, will get the most business. And so most of that's done from word of mouth, not from advertising campaigns or beautiful branding and great brochures. Most business, from our world anyway, a lot of it's coming from word of mouth. So you have to understand that these things are all sequential. Get the first bit right. Figure out why you do what you do so you can deliver the best service. Um, make sure you have as much knowledge as you can to be able to teach effectively and efficiently and then build the business on the back of that. And so um, it should be simple. What it shouldn't be is a time-consuming effort, right? So if you're teaching eight hours a day, the last thing you want to have to go and do is then spend another two or three hours on the admin and business side of of being a coach because it's always going to get left to the end and it's never getting done properly so i think keeping keeping the business as simple as possible is would be a a first thing to do and then make sure that there are mechanisms in place so that students that do come come back again Um, and a lot of that is down to a coach's awareness of the importance of repeat and referred business and there's nothing wrong with talking to students about when they come back and do they want to come back and this and booking that lesson before they leave book the next lesson before they've left because there's a there's a there's a uh, let's, I don't know what you call it I'm going to come up with a term like a post lesson high that they get because they you're never going to leave a lesson with them duffing a ball right you're always going to make sure they pure the last shot so they are absolutely at the the most um, susceptible to booking another lesson and to telling somebody else how great that lesson was probably an hour after the lesson. And then after that, there'll be a little decline. And you probably after 24 hours, that lesson's probably forgotten and they're onto something else. They're dropping the kids off and whatever else. So there's probably a window after delivering a good lesson to get them to tell, tell somebody else how good the lesson was and then get and book another lesson. And, Quite often, I think that's some of the, to what you were saying, Gal, that's some of the easiest stuff that maybe just doesn't get recognized because you're so focused on delivering a great lesson. And then you think, okay, well, that was done. Now I've got my next lesson in an hour's time. And so you're already on to the next student and you've forgotten about the guy that's about to book another lesson for you. And so um, I think that, that would probably be the, the biggest learning I've seen working in this industry, I think. Fascinating. I think... Um... What would you say to um, specialization in terms of your brand? Because obviously we've got different, you can specialize in different areas of coaching, right? So Mm -hmm. you've got elite, you've got juniors, kids, women. Um, What would you say it would be better for a coach to specialize and to promote that or to be the jack of all trades? 
Well, if you take take an example of someone like James Ridget, I asked him that same question, and um, um, he said that he was a so-so coach, and this was his own words, and he didn't really have anything that differentiated him from the next PGA pro. And so he was clearly quite an academic guy, so he was able to go away and study the short game and come up with theories but he said he did that so that he could differentiate himself from the next coach it wasn't I'm passionate about the short game that's all I want to teach he was quite uh he was quite clear about why he did it that he wanted to to separate himself and so I think there's probably a an argument to say that if you have a a specialization and a differentiator then it helps you stand out now it doesn't mean that's all you do I think it, it's it's very beneficial to have a broad perspective of the golf swing and to understand all the components of it. But if it gives you a leg up and you're known as the putting guy, as the short game guy, as the junior guy, whatever, or girl, whatever it might be, then purely as a brand marketing person, you've got something that you can then get behind and start selling and people will talk about because you need, you need a reason for somebody to talk about you. And just to say he's a great golf coach is very forgettable, right? There's a lot of good golf coaches to say, I've never had a lesson with someone who knew more about wedge play than this guy. He was just amazing. You're going to tell somebody about that or his, the, the, the knowledge he had about putting was incredible. And so I'm going to go back to him. So I think it's probably depends on where you are in terms of the coaching hierarchy. So clearly you can make a, profession or a career like James has done or um, others have in you know Dave Peltz clearly is just all about short game and it's very clear that that's what that business does and that's what you go for them it's a lot easier for people to buy something if they understand what they're getting so yeah I would I would say that that it's not a it's not a necessity to be successful at all but I think it can certainly help a coach if they have a specialization that they're very very clear about and that it's easy for people to recognize and and talk about i think that's that's certainly a a, a good idea fascinating i've got one final question actually which i'm hope i hope you're okay answering um <laughs> what uh what differences do you see in managing the academy at champions gate versus the global business uh, well, they're clearly different demands. So the Academy at Champions Gate is the same challenge that everyone listening to this that's running their own academies or has their own coaching business. And that's understanding the daily operations of, of a live business that has clients in front of you and you have to deliver a service. And so there are, there are some absolute similarities between the two sides of the business and then there are some practical differences so practical differences from an academy at champions gate is more to do with operations than anything else and so how do we make sure the service that's offered and delivered at champions gate is absolutely at the top top level and it's a real high performance facility that every detail that goes into your experience here pre during and post lesson is as good as it can be um, I think some of that um, high performance mindset, if you like, then translates straight across over to the global business. And so um, where the global business is covering licensing, so our licensee partners and then university, you know, all of the students and coaches that we're training, we don't get the as much interpersonal connection with, with that side of the business. A lot of times you're dealing virtually or you're dealing with longer term relationships that um, you probably have to concentrate more on, on how you're communicating than what you're communicating in that side of the business. You can get away with figuring stuff out when you've got customers in front of you because you can kind of re react to what they're telling you or what you're seeing, right? So you, you can kind of move quite quickly, but you have to be really, really planned and organized within our global business to make sure that we're servicing and delivering the needs of, of what we have in the company. I, I like, I really like that question, Gav, because it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a business challenge that we have to be able to wear two hats. How do you, how do you make sure that these guys over here are really happy whilst the rest of the group is, is delivered? So um, 
the, the similarities are in terms of how we approach it. So we don't, I don't think we, um, we forget about the importance of people and that we're educating. So they're both educating businesses. It's just that we are directly educating people at Champions Gate and we're educating people through the network on the global side of the business but it's ultimately the same product at the end of the day it's how do you get a message across and how do you impart knowledge on somebody so that they understand what's going on um i like it i like i, I don't think i could ever sit in a business that um was just one dimensional i've always liked almost too too much on my plate because it keeps it keeps the interest you, you probably noticed that <laughs> um but no it's a it's, uh, fascinating business it certainly is understanding the different dynamics between different departments yeah fantastic Ben uh, I've got a question but probably not aimed at you Ben and uh, we've got somebody else on the call here that um, has been with our academies a long time and deals with this sort of stuff every day so Paul Dyer's on the call he's one of our master instructors been with us for for many many years and has a huge experience but also has developed multiple academies in Germany, but manages those and has built those up, but also manages a team of instructors. So on this conversation, Paul, if you don't mind, it'd be great to hear a little bit from you in terms of some of your key learnings from the how you've built your business in Germany, how you manage your team of instructors, some of the challenges that you always face. Uh, I'd be fascinated to hear a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, first, first of all, it's, it's all a facade. We're, we're still learning every day. We've no idea what we're doing, uh, but it seems to have worked this far. Um, I think it's very difficult to, to pinpoint specific tools that you could say, well, you know, we've done this and that's why it always worked great. And um, uh, I, I, I like what, what Ben said about the, you know, I think I, hear a Simon Sinek influence in, um, in what you said. Um, and we've, we've sort of gone about it in a similar way. You know, I've, I've worked for a long time here in Germany with Ian Holloway. And um, we've, we've always said, look, get, get the product right, offer high quality instruction and the people will come and the, the, uh, the revenue will come and, and all these goals, whatever it is you're setting, whether it's elite players, um, get your product right first and, and believe in it. Um, because I think we're, we're in, the, in, in, in a pretty unique situation in that we really believe what we're selling. Um, we're not selling plastic dog poo or we're not selling dodgy internet contracts or anything like that we we're selling something that really really helps people and for the most part that's probably also been our number one drawback as well in the fact that we're absolutely terrible salespeople um because we don't really want to sell anybody anything um we really see ourselves as people who offer the best golf instruction there is but it's very aligned with what what ben said in that you, you've got to know why you're doing it and it's super easy to know why you're doing it if you want to be an elite golf school. It doesn't matter if you're teaching elite golfers or whether that's just weekend warriors. If you want to offer them the best you can, then it's there's so many decisions that, that go, you know, filter down from that, which are totally obvious. You know, it's like, do we, do we need a track man? Well, yeah, of course we do, because if we don't, we can't possibly offer the best we're, we're doing. And is it, you know, the way you set up the tea, the way you do basically everything is, uh, is obvious when you've, when you've uh, got that goal working. What I, what I do fight against on a daily basis, and it'd be interesting, Ben, to, to hear what you think about this, but what I find on a daily basis is that uh, standards naturally slip, obviously, and which is fine. Um, and I've seen my job over the last, uh, particularly these last 12 months where we've got all sorts of different challenges going on uh, with, with COVID and so forth, is to make sure that everybody on board really does understand um, this is what we're trying to do. Because if, if you understand we're trying to do the best we can, then you probably never make a bad decision. Even as a brand new hire has just started with us, 
there's there's no uh, there's no problem with that. And it's mm. uh, it's almost like for me as, as as I see the academy director role is making sure everybody understands that um, this is what we want. We want the best. And that doesn't mean we've got money to throw around and we're going to buy absolutely everything that, that comes on the market and so forth. But it does mean that that's, that's our goal. And, and on everybody's level, whether it's, whether it's me or whether it's somebody doing a beginner's course or you know, clearing up the academy after a day's work, shall I do this? Shall I do this? Well, how does it align with, uh, with being the best we can be? And I think actually, once you figure that out, um, it's pretty easy to know where you're gonna go. Uh, and I would certainly agree with the, um, the statement earlier about um, don't do it just because of the money. Um, uh, I think the worst things I've probably done over the year, the worst decisions have been things that I've done because, oh, that sounds like a good deal. Uh, great revenue, we'll do that this year. I mean, going back many, many years, I think that's a criticism we could have leveled at ourselves maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I think now it's, I don't see any anything happening like that at all uh, these days. So um, for me, those would be the, uh, the, the key thing. So echoing your words, Ben, uh, basically it's um, uh, get your product right first, believe in it. Uh, and have everybody else understanding, which is a really, really difficult job, by the way, but have everybody else understand. Uh, and actually then things do become easier. I think it's, it comes back to the culture, probably. And I think you have a what's, what's incredibly heartening is guys like yourself, Paul, that have been part of the brand for so long. Clearly something's working, right? Because there isn't a huge turnover within the business. You know, a lot of times, I'm sure there's, there's, there's academies that we've opened that have since closed and you you learn so much from them. It's like, did we just rush into that? Did we really understand if that was the right people to carry our brand in that country? And I will I will tell you right now, we made a whole bunch of mistakes um, chasing after those things that you then learn from. But if you if you run a business or you run your own life scared of making mistakes, you'll you'll never achieve anything. And um, I mean, that goes to into sport or anything you're doing in life. You've got to be brave enough to make mistakes, realize that you made a mistake and then you you carry on. But if you're going to fail, you fail fast and then you you adapt. And um, I think there's a there's a cultural there's certainly been a, a, a since COVID started. I think one of the biggest things that we have discussed is, is culture and what kind of culture do we want for our business and for our brand and how can we best impart that culture on all of you guys, all of our network of coaches and partners and brands and who do we associate ourselves with? Who do we hire? Our hiring process, I think I've definitely evolved in the last couple of years in terms of who we hire and, and you want people that um, you can kind of look them in the eye and know that they get mm -hmm. it and that things like attention to detail and, um, the purpose that you have are safeguarded and you can get very very easily distracted by kind of the old excuse well we're really busy so to your point Paul oh well a few things have slipped and that's so so easy to get into but um, I think if we create an environment that is welcoming to new coaches and to new ideas and to people who genuinely want to improve and excel and deliver a world-class lesson if you get all of those bits right then you'll have the right people if you hire somebody because they say i want to be the next great tour coach and that's what i want to be or i want to make a million dollars selling training aids or whatever whatever the aspirations are i'd always question that and um think that there's that maybe there isn't quite the substance behind it so um, yeah, it's a never ending challenge of reinforcing a positive culture. And I, first thing is to identify what your culture is and what your core values are as a business. And um, they don't really change much. We're fortunate that we have David as a, as a founder because his values are the values that we try and impart across the business and to everybody else. But then how do you then go into work every day trying to live by those values and 
make sure that you've got a team around you that can just naturally deliver it without questioning where you're at. Um, I think that's a that's a really interesting challenge. I, Gavin pointed me towards a podcast with Toto Wolf, the Mercedes F1 boss, and that's a guy that I was really surprised listening to him because you kind of have a preconception that Formula One is just all about the machine and it's all about engineering and the best technicians will win. And this guy completely turned that around and said, no, it's nothing to do with that. It's just how the it's how you get the most out of your people. And good people will figure out good technology that will deliver a really fast racing car. And if you don't have good people, it doesn't matter how good your technology is. It's never going to be successful. And I think that's the same for our business certainly is that um, there's a there's guys that get it and they're on board there's guys that don't get it or girls that don't get it and they shouldn't be on board and that's it kind of comes quite simple um, of how you then make sure that your business is actually going in the right direction um, so I, I like that clarity and I think that Paul you're, you're, you're I love your honesty always you always tell us that you don't know it all yet but um, I think we're all in the same boat we're learning every day aren't we and I think it's if, if you didn't make mistakes, you wouldn't be human. So I'm, we're with you on that one, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, have, uh, a, I have a question to you in terms of, um, um, obviously, we've, as I said, you, we've moved, I think we've made all the mistakes you can make. Um, yeah. Hires who don't quite work out. How, how do you deal with... Um, with that kind of scenario, whether it's, you know, let's take the example of someone you hired, thought was great. Um, and it's like, well, okay, he's, he's doing a job for us. It's, it's fine. You know, the lessons are okay. That, you know, there's, there's nothing really wrong, but I know it's not a great fit. Um, particularly uh, with us in Northern Europe, with the seasonality of a business, it's very difficult right now in, in April to say, Hey, look, uh, Whoever, Ian Holloway, I'm sorry, I thought you were good at teaching, but you're absolutely useless. Um, uh, you know, this is recorded. Do you have a specific <laughs> example in mind here, Paul? <laughs> uh, no, I'm using, obviously, I'm using a, a ridiculous example. But what, you know, in terms of sort of like how, how you viewed things and how you've done um, yeah. things, you know, how do you how do you follow up on that kind of you know once you've established whether it's a bad hire or a bad decision it's, it's easy enough to say well change it immediately but that's not always that simple yeah, um, that's the hardest thing to do Paul I find that the hardest thing to do because I think at heart I, I I like to please people as a as a person as a manager I don't typically like confrontation that's probably one of the things the weaknesses that I have to to try and improve on is is having that decisiveness to it's one thing to identify that there's a weakness it's a whole other matter to action it because you then make practical decisions well if that guy goes then i'll probably lose this much revenue or uh, what if that happens if this guy goes and what and you just end up second guessing yourself and actually your heart is telling you that there isn't a future for that person and you're better off cutting it quickly and i think uh, uh, alex ferguson's um, book said the only decisions he regretted making were the decisions he didn't make and I think that's the I think that's such a, a strong analogy I love comparing football to business because it's it comes quite naturally to me there's a there's a really good book which I recommend everyone gets called the Barcelona way you don't have to be a Barcelona fan like Chamber, but um, <laughs> it was written by Damien Hughes that um, studies all sorts of kind of comparison between business and sport but it, it basically goes into the culture and how Barcelona was created by Cruyff back in the day and then how Pep Guardiola took it over but there was this there was this culture that if you didn't fit into how they wanted to play the game and you can relate how Barcelona plays football to how a business operates in terms of the tactics they have on the field and the people they physically put into the different positions if you didn't fit then you were out and they had a this analogy was of Samuel Eto who was the most expensive player in the world at the time scored a ton of goals and Pep Guardiola cut him from the team and sold him, got rid of him. And everyone said, this guy's mad. He's just got rid of his star. But he, he understood that he was kind of the bad apple in the, in the group. And that would just bring everybody else down or that would affect everything. So I don't, 
definitely don't propose and you know, try and pretend like I've got all of those skills and answers to do that. But I think every time you go through it, you learn a bit more and then you get a little bit tougher probably to say, actually, I've been through this once before. I'm not going to go through it again. And uh, yeah, I would, it's, it's not an easy thing, but it's, it's a necessity probably is to protect the greater good of where you're going, that everybody has to be on that same, the same pulling in the same direction. And it may just be that you've got a great guy with um, technical faults. So great person, but doesn't have the skills to deliver a lesson to the standards that a Ledbetter Academy expects. And that is a practical issue where you say, fine, well, either they can learn this stuff and I can spend the time developing them and training them, or they have to go because they're going to be impact the quality of what I'm delivering. Equally, you can have the best technical coach in the world with a terrible attitude. And you'd say, well, I'll make excuses for them because they're a great coach and they're delivering great lessons and they're bringing in lots of money. And so I don't know which you prefer. I don't know, Paul, which you prefer, a great, great coach with amazing knowledge and a bad attitude or a, a weaker coach with an incredible attitude. Uh, I, I, it's probably one that you, know, it's probably, you can argue it both ways, probably, can't you? I, I don't think you can actually. For me, uh, the the latter, um, the uh, a, a great person. That was a lead. That was a leading question for you. So I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought you might. Um, uh, the the um, for me, I've obviously a great coach with a, a terrible attitude. I don't think I've ever seen him because I don't think he can be a great coach with a terrible yeah. attitude. I agree. Um, although thinking of a couple of the leading names in golf. I'm not quite so sure, but, but whatever. Um, I think uh, amongst LGA, if we think about the people who've, um, who've uh, been with us over the years or still are and, and, and are really shining lights for us, uh, they've, they've been good people first. And yeah. um, uh, you, you can learn all this stuff. There was a time when none of us knew how to play golf and didn't know what golf was. Yeah. Um, so... I was sure. I was sure when I was 11 years old, I was going to be a professional rugby player, until I figured out that small people don't make it. Um, uh, up to that point, I had no idea about golf or teaching or anything. So, um, and I see that uh, with some of the people on the call um, that you you become a good person first and develop yourself as a person, and I think the rest will definitely come for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm with you. I mean, that obviously that clearly um, echoes our beliefs as a business. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in doing the things we're doing, setting up a university. Um, if we weren't interested in developing the technical knowledge that people have, then we wouldn't bother doing what we're doing. But I've, we're such a firm believer that if you find the right people and give them the skills, then they'll be hugely successful. And then it's down to them. That's not us at all. You're just going to give them the tools to be successful. And they can clearly the brand helps because there's a pedigree and there's guys like yourselves and others that have been doing this for years and years before, which carries on with, with the badge and what the badge means. Um, but yeah, if you have a, if you have the wrong person with the wrong attitude, they'll never make it as a coach. And I'll, maybe ultimately that kind of, they get sorted out anyway, just because you're, you're going to find that they aren't the successful ones and they're going to leave at their own accord. But um, interesting subject, isn't it? Where you can, when you're not on your own if maybe it's different if you're on your own if you're a sole guy just teaching on your own you can be whatever you want to be because you're only answering to yourself if you're in a team environment then clearly there's a greater good that you're working towards so you have to find as a director of an academy you've got to find the right balance between your team that you're delivering for you know for the business oh, brilliant um Ben, I think we've got about time for one question. I know Sarah's posted a question sure. here in the chat box. So Sarah, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask Ben personally. Um, so if you're still there. And if she's not, I'll ask you the question. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not. So anyway, Ben, Sarah asked, what positive teaching changes? I'm sorry, Stuart, oh, I go. am here. Hi, I'm Sarah. sorry. Hi, um, I'm sorry, I'm working, so I don't have my camera on. But I was just curious, what, um, what positive teaching changes 
or strategies um, have you been able to implement that maybe you wouldn't have been able to implement if it wasn't for COVID? And to build on that, like how do you plan on keeping the new things that you've learned and the new strategies uh, going forward? Yeah, uh, so I mean, there's, gosh, there's so many things that we learned from it. Um, I think from a from a teaching perspective, actually, what COVID highlighted is that communication and good, clear, honest communication with your clients is the most important thing. And so that's definitely something that was highlighted. I think we did a pretty good job as a group anyway, communicating with with clients. But um, when you suddenly take away the ability to actually stand in front of your customer and talk to them and teach them, then clearly you have to, you have to do that virtually and online. And it then really starts to single out those that know their stuff and those that don't. So you can get, like I've said before, you can get away with a slightly average lesson if the person's in front of you, because you can kind of adapt. You can't get away with a not knowing your stuff and not having a really clear picture in your mind of how to help a golfer if you're doing it online. So I think the the biggest learning we've had is is that as a as teachers and as coaches we have to go into um, into every situation every lesson that we're delivering with a really clear um, simple message for our customers so that there isn't the there isn't the confusion of why well, are you just bombarding me with with a whole bunch of different techniques and drills and tactics you don't really know what you're doing you're just kind of throwing everything at me and something will stick so it's probably singles out those coaches that really know their stuff and those that don't and that that then probably relates back to whether they have put the time in learning the techniques and then learning the education and their craft as as coaches um so i would say communication is probably the the biggest there's obvious ones like online lessons and t- more tactical stuff that that carry on but um, I think they're just delivery mechanisms that um, that we had at our disposal. We just weren't using them because COVID highlighted the need for it. Thank you. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Thank ben. you. Well played. I think what was really difficult about that, Ben, wasn't it, was how we actually didn't know what COVID was all about. We didn't know the true extent of the problem. And so no. it... it generally took it when you you were kind of knocked out for a while and a a bit hazy weren't we and it was like well if we actually knew the severity of the situation that we were in and the duration that we'd be in it for then we probably could have reacted a lot quicker with some definitive answers yeah but But then it was just trip i I mean hindsight is a wonderful thing but then it doesn't give you the the ability to learn so if we hadn't gone through what we had done the last year and Mm -hmm stood blankly looking at each other saying, what do we do now? You then aren't forced to make, you can't learn, you can't adapt, you can't make decisions. So we were, you have to be flexible in business, right? There's um, there's a Churchill quote I love that was, um, I'm gonna probably get it wrong, but it's something along the lines of to improve is to change, but to be perfect is to change often. Um, and so if you're scared of change and you will have a fixed mindset, I think you're screwed in life and in business and in sport and anything. If you have a open mind and a open perspective to try new things and to learn new things, then I think you can achieve anything. And um, that's, that's definitely rings true of the last 12 months, I think for us. And luckily we're kind of a small team, which is a, which is an advantage in a small business because we can be quite adaptable and move and, I think it's probably harder for the bigger companies that maybe just are on a railway track and that's it. That's their future and that's their destiny. And so I don't think we should be scared of pivoting and changing and trying new things. And that's, that's, that's exciting. That's a, that's a, uh, that's why we're all in what we do, I guess, is to, to try and push the, uh, push the envelope a little bit. Absolutely. Well, I think that brings us pretty much to a close, Ben, on behalf of Gavin and myself and everybody that's on the call. I'm sure we express our sincere thanks for you taking time out of your busy schedule um, to talk about this today. I'm sure everybody's enjoyed it. Uh, Paul, thank you to you and Sarah and everybody else for being here. Um, And we'll see you hopefully next week or next week's Under the Hat. Next week, we're just waiting on confirmation from the Gray Institute. 
Um, hopefully we'll have some great information about their functional golf training system. So watch out in the worldwide instructors group for that being posted and more information about that as well. So, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And a big thanks to, to Stuart and Gavin. You guys do a great job getting this off the ground. So I know everyone, I pro hopefully I speak on behalf of the whole network to, <laughs> to, to thank you for putting the effort in to get these going. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a really worthwhile way of spending time, I think, is sharing ideas and talking. And even if we're not all together, it, it's not stopping us from um, from interacting within the network. So we're pleased you're doing this, guys. Thank you. Appreciate awesome. it.